Well, once again, it's uh, my privilege and Geneva's privilege of worshiping with you and sharing with you this morning. I've been looking forward uh, to this message since early Monday morning. The Lord just woke me up and he gave me uh, two words. And I thought about those two words for a while and he just wouldn't let me leave them alone all week long. Um, so this is a message I haven't pulled out of my file. This is brand new. Something I've thought about before. And um, I think it, it has already impacted my life. And I trust that it will, um, God will speak to you today as well too. The title of the message is Jesus Wept. Those were the two words that he woke me up with. We find that a couple of times in Scripture, and one of those is in John, the 11th chapter, and um, we'll get to that here in just a few moments, but if you'd like to turn to that now and uh, prepare yourself, I'll be sharing out of the NIV as I have before uh, this morning as we share together. This last Tuesday was uh, July the 4th. A lot of celebration went on in this community, I'm sure, and um, we had the opportunity to uh, celebrate in the Cameron, Maysville area as well, and enjoyed that time of uh, rejoicing in the freedom that we enjoy. What a privilege it is, you know, it's by God's design, but, you know, to be blessed to be born in America and have the privileges and the opportunities that we have. I know there's some down things that we're concerned about. Uh, but God is going to take care of all those types of things uh, in his own way and in his own timing. But not only will we be rejoicing in the freedoms that we enjoy here in the United States, but probably in your mind and in your heart, you were thinking about those that are living, that pr preserve our freedoms today, as well as those that have given their lives, literally, so that we might enjoy freedom here in the United States and try to bring an aspect of freedom around the world as well, too. So there might have been some weeping that went on as we remembered certain individuals. I was thinking of uh, Geneva's dad and my dad and service in the military as well too. And a good friend of ours in Maysville had posted in, on Facebook, I don't look at it all the time, but once in a while I'll look at that, and she had posted about her brother who was in the Vietnam War. I grew up in that era. Uh, went to college during that particular time of our history of the United States as well. His name was Randy, and she basically said, uh, I still miss you, brother, because he lost his life in Vietnam. Fifty-two years ago, she said, Randy was killed on the battlefield. I thought about that and reminded me of one of my high school buddies. Tommy Wright was his name. He was our wing back in football. Tommy would get the ball over here on the right hand side and there was a trap from the guard pulling out and coming across the line behind the center and they trapped that defensive man coming across and Tommy would slip through the line and a lot of times would uh, even go for a touchdown if not make a lot of yards in that uh, still away 21 cutback. I can remember the day that I came home from Northeast Missouri State in those days, Truman University as I was going to college in 1967. We just received word that Tommy had been killed in Vietnam. I went to the funeral they didn't even open his casket. And I wept. I was my buddy, one of my football players that I played with, that I'd grown up with. Jesus wept in John, the 11th chapter. Turn there with me as we look at that together. I'm going to begin there in verse 33 of the text. 
It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, that is Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see the Lord. And Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, See how he loved him. See how he loved him. This was when later on Lazarus would be raised from the dead. That's a message and a story within itself. But I want us to concentrate just this morning initially on the emotion that was in this place as Jesus was, as best we know, probably in northern Galilee somewhere. Uh, some would indicate that he possibly was at the site where he was baptized by John the Baptist there in the River Jordan. We can't say for sure where Jesus was, but he was not in Bethany. We know that. And word came to him that Lazarus, his good friend, was sick, sick unto death. We know because of the scripture why Jesus tarried, but the scripture says he, he waited two days before he said to the disciples that were with him, let's go to Jerusalem. And they were concerned because he'd already been there and there was some opposition against Christ at this particular point in time as well. But he had this burden to go and to be there with Mary and Martha in the reality that his good friend Lazarus was dead. So the scripture says earlier in this text, as you would look at it for yourself, he meets Martha. Now best we can understand, he probably came from northern Galilee down the Jordan Rift, and he came up the Jericho Road, and he came to a place there on the Mount of Olives that turns, and one way you go to Jerusalem to the right, and the other you go to the left to Bethany. And so there was a well there. And so he had paused there for a moment, and Martha knew that he was coming that particular direction, and so she had left Bethany and came to that point in the road. And she was the first one to greet Jesus. And I was intrigued once again by the words that she said as she gathered there with the Lord. You see, Lazarus had already died by this time, and he was in the grave for four days. And Martha said to him, Lord... If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Pick that up with me there in verse 22. But she goes on and says, But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, Well, I, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You must have been of a Pharisee understanding at that time because they believed in the resurrection. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. You know, that gives me some insight into Martha's life, Mary's life, as well as Lazarus. You see, they'd already come to that understanding that he was the Messiah and that God had sent him for a particular purpose. We've already looked at verses 33 and following, but I want to highlight that once again for us says there in verse 32 that when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, same words that Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You see, they didn't understand what Jesus knew already, that this was by God's design. He had a purpose for all of this. And so they were looking at it from a human standpoint. Their brother had died. They were in a state of grief. They'd been grieving now for four days. And Lazarus was already in the tomb. He was in that ground tomb that they had prepared, and there his body laid. 
as Jesus greeted Martha and Mary on this occasion. But I don't want you to miss what the crowd noticed as well too and how Jesus responded to that as we read that earlier. It says he was deeply moved in spirit and he was troubled. And the crowd responded and said, see how he loved Lazarus? And Jesus wept because his good friend Lazarus was dead. Even though he knew that later on he was going to resurrect him from the dead, he was grieving in his spirit, just like you and I grieve in our spirit when we lose someone that we're close to and we hear of their death and we go through that process of grieving. It's only natural. Every funeral that I've ever preached, I always share that with the congregation that gathers there at that graveside, at that funeral. It's only natural that we feel the way that we feel in a time such as that. And that's what Jesus was feeling on this particular occasion. You know, as, as I woke up this last Monday morning and thought about these two words, Jesus wept, as I continued to roll that within my heart and within my mind and try to understand the message that God laid upon my heart, even to share with you this morning, I thought about the times that my mother had wept. I think a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago or so, when I was here supplied, shared with you my testimony of how I came to know Jesus as my Savior and walked down that aisle and my mom was crying. Well, those were, those were tears of joy. Those were not tears of sadness. But there have been some other times in my mother's life that she's wept tears of sadness. Tears of sadness. One time was when we were serving in Branson. The phone rang and uh, our secretary answered the phone and she buzzed me on the uh, intercom and said, Rodney, your mom and dad's pastor is on the phone and he needs to talk with you. That was the day that my dad was killed tragically in a truck accident. My mama was weeping. My dad was dead. Later on in life, she remarried and by the name of a fellow by the name of Ellis Cooper. Of all things, he was a Baptist preacher. <laughs> Served in Lancaster First Baptist Church for a long, long time. And, but there came that day when he got cancer and he died in Clinton Hospital after they'd moved to that area. I think it was a couple of weeks ago when we were rejoicing with uh, the young lady that came back from her mission trip. And I mentioned this, that she probably had some homesickness when she was coming back. Well, it reminded me of my homesickness. I've had homesickness to my remembrance about three times. And one of those times was when growing up as a boy, my mom uh, allowed me to go and visit with my Uncle Dean and my cousin Bobby who's 20 days younger than I am and they lived on a farm and so I always enjoyed every weekend that we were able to leave Centre and go to Macon, uh, Bevere actually, and north of Bevere where they had their farm. I always enjoyed being on the farm and the things that we were able to do and going to fishing with my cousin and, and doing all those type of things and so this one summer mama gave me permission to go and stay a couple of weeks with my uncle and my cousin. And I can remember on my way back from Macon on the bus, back to Centralia, my hometown, I had that gut level feeling of homesickness. Not that I was going back home, but because I was leaving some place that I loved and I wanted to be longer. I had that homesickness feeling within my heart and within my life at that point. And the Lord allowed me to remember that because of my Uncle Dean. Uncle Dean had served in the military and he got a Dear John letter while he was still overseas, heartbroken, came back, remarried, had all my cousins by his second wife, my, Bob, my cousin Bobby as well too. And my mom shared with me that she was really concerned about her brother. 
She was the middle child of uh, three children. So there was a revival at uh, First Baptist Church of Centralia years ago, and um, you might have remembered the name of uh, Clyde Childs. He's a well-known evangelist in Missouri. At that particular time, uh, Jim McNeil, who had launched off on his own uh, and has his own ministry, he and Clyde would always do revivals together, and Clyde would preach, and Jim McNeil would be the song leader. So they were scheduled to come to First Baptist Church of Centralia as I, as I was a child. And my mama had made arrangements somehow for my Uncle Dean, which was t totally unusual, for my uncle to give up his farm and even take time to come down to Centralia and visit with us. But he was there. So she had prearranged that week of revival for the evangelist and the music evangelist to come over to our house so that they could witness to my Uncle Dean. And I can remember that time. They were sitting on the sofa there, and there was Clyde, and there was Uncle Dean, and my mom was there, and I was there. I don't know if my other brothers were there or not, but I can remember that Clyde was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with my uncle. Right there in my home. Right there in my home. See, my mom was concerned about her brother that did not know Jesus Christ as a Savior and the Lord of his life. Years later, my Uncle Dean died of a heart attack. He was one of those farmers that would work seven days a week before the sun came up until the sun set of an evening. He didn't have any time for the church. He didn't have any time for the Lord. He thought he needed to work all the time. A hard, hard worker. And at his funeral, my mama wept. Because Uncle Dean had never accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He's in hell today, folks. Because he never accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior and the Lord of his life. She wept at that funeral because she'd lost her brother. But she really wept. And still would really weep. weep. You know, I've spoken with my mom. She's still living in Columbia in a facility there because she has dementia now. And, and I thank the Lord that right now, the times that I speak with her, she doesn't remember her brother who was lost. But before she had dementia, I could see her at times weeping and being in great sorrow. They grew up together. They rode horses together. They walked to school together. You know what I'm talking about. And she wept bitterly because my Uncle Dean went to hell when he breathed his last breath. It was Palm Sunday, A.D. 33. Turn with me to Luke, if you would, the 19th chapter. I want to begin there in verse 28. Luke 19, 28. And after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say to them, The Lord needs it. You know this story, as Jesus enters on Palm Sunday, as he comes into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. A few years ago, a couple years ago, Geneva and I had the opportunity to go to Jerusalem. I'd been there for the second time, it was our first opportunity. 
And I can remember standing on the Mount of Olives and looking across the Kidron Valley and seeing the dome. This is exactly this setting here in this particular text where Jesus is coming down from the Mount of Olives and he's about to cross the Kidron Valley and go in and notice what the crowd is saying as he's riding that donkey, that colt, and they're throwing the palm branches and all those things that we think about during Palm Sunday before Easter. And they cry out and say, Blessed is a king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But here's one I want to catch this morning. Look with me in verse 41. As he, that is Jesus, approached Jerusalem in this setting I'm talking about this morning and saw the city, what's he do? He wept. He wept. Now why do you think Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem? because he knew what was in store for him, because he knew that even though he was willing to lay down his life for all of mankind and whoever chooses to believe and recognize that they're a sinner in need of Christ as Savior can reach out to him the sacrifice that he offered on the cross as he shed his precious blood that we might have salvation. Jesus wept on this occasion because he knew that there were numbers of those that would not accept his sacrifice. They would never come to know him as a Savior and the Lord and the Messiah like Lazarus, Mary, and Martha knew that he was the Messiah, God's Christ, that would be sacrificed on the cross. And the scripture says, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. That summer of 1967, as I sat there in front of that casket, I wept over my good friend Tommy and his death. Marcia wept over her brother Randy as she heard of his death in Vietnam. My mom wept over my dad's death her second husband's death. Now, I don't know about Tommy. I don't know if he ever knew Jesus as a Savior. I'll have to admit, I wasn't as strong as I should have been, and I never witnessed to him about a faith relationship in Jesus Christ. So I don't know where he is today. I don't. And I really am not that familiar with my good friend's brother, Randy. I think he was a Christian, but I don't know for sure. I never had the opportunity to talk with him. He died before I went to Maysville. But I am confident where my dad is. He's with the Lord today. And I am confident that I know where Ellis is not just because he was a Baptist preacher, but because he knew Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of his life. But as I already shared with you, I know where my Uncle Dean is. And that's why Jesus wept from the Mount of Olives as he looked across the Kidron Valley into Jerusalem because he knew that many would not accept him as a savior and the Lord of his life. You see, my mom had witnessed to my uncle, Dean, on numerous occasions. She'd prearranged for Clyde to come to our house and Uncle Dean be there as well too, so that he could hear the gospel presented. And I know there were countless times that she prayed earnestly for her brother that he would come to know Jesus Christ as Savior before he met death. Look with me there in verse 42. It says, Jesus wept over Jerusalem and said, 
If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. What's that mean? Eternal life. Eternal life. To bring you peace. Not only in this lifetime, but for eternity. That's what Jesus was referring to here. Now drop down with me toward the end of verse 44. Jesus goes on and says, Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. My Uncle Dean had the opportunity, sitting right there on that sofa, to recognize that he was a sinner in need of Christ as his Savior. And Brother Clyde shared the truth and the reality of who Jesus was. But my Uncle Dean never came to that time, as far as I know, of saying, Father, I'm a sinner in need of Christ as my Savior. And right now, I reach out and ask you to come into my heart and into my life. My dear friend, you might be in that case right now today. I don't know. I know some of you, but I don't know all of you. And you might be here today, just like my Uncle Dean was sitting on that soft sofa. You're sitting on that soft pew right now, or maybe you're watching us in live stream in your home. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? On Palm Sunday of A.D. 33, my dear friend, Jesus wept over you. He wept over you. But today he wants to rejoice from heaven at the right hand of the Father if you would come to know him as a Savior and the Lord of your life. But here's the real reason, I think, why God woke me up this last Monday morning and gave me those two words. Rodney, when's the last time that you wept? You understand what I'm saying? When's the last time that you fell to your knees at the altar and wept over somebody that you know that does not know Jesus Christ as a Savior and the Lord of your life? Wow. That's what gripped my heart all week long. Because I didn't do that for Tommy. Oh, I wept at his funeral. But I didn't weep over him as somebody that I needed to witness to. And I'll have to say, admittedly, there's been numbers of other times that I should have been weeping. And I haven't. I haven't. So here's my challenge for every one of us today as I close. Don't wait until you weep over their grave. It's too late. It's too late then. But rather, weep here at the altar if you need to, even today. And weep over them in your time of prayer. Tuesday mornings, usually I'm sitting in my easy chair there in our living room kitchen area. And I grab my prayer book off of the shelf there by that chair. And I open up to a section. And it's filled with names that are lost. Lord, help me every time I look at that name to at least have a spirit of weeping in my heart every time I pray over them. That they might come to know Jesus Christ. That their eyes might be open to the truth and the reality of who Jesus truly is. And might there come a day before they die that I weep with joy like my mom did when her firstborn walked down that aisle and accepted Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Lord of his life. Jesus wept over the death of his friend Lazarus 
but he was weeping bitterly over Jerusalem. And those that will end up in hell if they never accept Christ as Savior, might we do the same. Let's pray together. Father, it's my prayer that our hearts would be moved this morning in spirit and even troubled to the point where Jesus was as he wept over Jerusalem because he knew that there would be many that would reject him, that would never accept him. And Lord, you reminded us of that in John, the third chapter, verse 18, that if you've never accepted me in your lifetime, you've already rejected me. So Lord, I pray that if there is someone here this morning who are listening in and watching on live stream, if they've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray that your Holy Spirit is speaking to their heart this very moment. But Lord, I would also pray for us as believers that as we are concerned about individuals that we know, that we love, that we care about, that we go to school with, that we work alongside of, that are our neighbors or our friends down the road on a country road, that we know do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that Lord, we would be to that point of grief that we would weep over their lost souls and that we would get up from our weeping and our knees and that we would go to them and share the good news of Jesus Christ that they too might know Jesus and there might be a time that we would rejoice as we cry together because they've come to know Christ as Savior. You've given us the privilege and the opportunity, Lord, to sow the seed and help us to do that in weeping as we're concerned about the lost, as Lord Jesus, you were. In your name we pray, and amen.